Dear listeners, welcome to Faces of Digital Health, a podcast about digital health and how healthcare systems adopt technologies. I am your host, Tiasha Zaitz, and this is the sixth and final episode of a short series about AI in healthcare. We went from the potential benefits for the patients in the first episode to AI development in radiology with the Chief Medical Information Officer at Nuance Wajin Kim. Radiologists play an important role in every aspect of medical imaging from when an exam gets ordered, to perform, to interpret it, to finally being delivered. Many radiologists also perform procedures. You know, I'm a musculoskeletal radiologist and I used to perform image-guided biopsies and injection of joints. And these are just a small sample of activities radiologists perform beyond just looking at pictures in dark rooms. The third episode featured Professor Dr. Tadej Batilino, world-renowned diabetologist and endocrinologist, and chief clinical at DreamEd Diabetes, who talked about AI in diabetes. Usually we suggest a very precise carb counting and decision-making for this insulin. But if you have a, a hybrid closed loop that includes automated bolusing, the system would understand that, yes, so you gave a bolus to your reading, and if you didn't give enough, the system will add the rest. Or if you give too much, the system will shut down insulin so that you can safely or safer, you know, go through the postprandial period, so the period after your meal. I also spoke to the CEO of Orbita, Bill Rogers, about the development of voice technologies thanks to AI. There's new technology being developed for just listening to the conversation versus a dictation type service. And so I think you'll see over the next year or so that it's the assistant is actually engaging in interacting in a way that it's on the sidelines as opposed to, you know, the doctor being distracted to just have to add notes and it's the assistant in that way. It, it'll automatically do that and it'll become a way to do actionable insights. So it might remind the doctor that they forgot to ask a particular question. And the previous episode was about stroke research and AI with Vince Madai, PhD in neuroscience, and Michelle Livne, PhD in machine learning from Charité University Hospital in Berlin. Basically, there are two ways how we can look at decision uh, uh, support. Um, one is, can we get to the decision faster? Now there are startups working on uh, systems that can show the vessel which is blocked, for example, automatically in in scans. The other aspect is selecting the right patients. So there are startups working on automated perfusion analysis and and other analyses of images to to help the physician select the patients for the current treatments. And what we are working on um, in the Prediction 2020 project is full clinical decision support, so based on the outcome of the patient after treatment to give the treating neurologist um, an idea which therapy the patient uh, could get and what to what outcome this could lead. Today's final episode features Bart David, who shared his thoughts about data privacy, the future of AI models in healthcare, and the issue of a potentially dystopian future if we decide to let monetization of healthcare data get out of control. Bart is a digital health tech expert who worked as an executive director for the world's largest technology vendors, such as IBM and SAP. He has been intimately involved as a mentor in the formation and growth of a dozen digital health startups and currently lectures at different universities in Germany, Belgium, Switzerland and Austria. Lately, he has been on a mission to harness the power of artificial intelligence to help solve current and future inequalities in healthcare. He is a founder of Hippo AI, an NGO that focuses on open sourcing medical AI. Before we start with the discussion, I'd like to thank all the listeners that have made the effort to leave a rating or review in their podcast providers. I'm thrilled to see we have eager listeners from the US, Germany, UK, France, Ecuador, and more. 
As I always say, I really, really appreciate every thought and suggestion. So keep following the podcast, visit the website www.facesofdigitalhealth.com and get in contact on LinkedIn or Twitter where you can find me under at ZAJC TJASA and to subscribe to the podcast to be notified about new episodes automatically. Now to AI data dilemmas and the future. Part end of 2017, Stephen Hawking said AI could be the worst event for humankind. And a few months later, Elon Musk said AI is more dangerous than nuclear weapon. Where do you stand on the question of the danger of AI? <laughs> I probably stand more on the uh, side of Elon Musk. Uh, and not for the particular reason that we have to look for a Terminator or something that is going to destroy us. But I think it's already impacting our society quite profoundly. I think for, for example, if you look at Facebook and the algorithms they have been using to influence a newsfeed or to decide which news we were seeing, this has already influenced the whole generation since the last 10 years. And if you look at the generations that grew up with uh, Facebook, they have a very particular mindset and they are not really good at looking at a world that is pluralistic. They are very strong on one single point and statement and they are kind of extreme in their thinking because that's what the algorithm did it was because um, they they kept being fed on in their, their confirmation beliefs. bias so i think we are already seeing the impact of what algorithms can do and i think these algorithms already had an impact on biology on the brain and how people think so i think the terminator might not be looking like the terminator in ai but i think the algorithms can really influence mass populations in the way how they think to perhaps make them a terminator in their way and acting so I think we need to be really careful about who owns that and who do we trust to develop these AI tools and algorithms and methods. You uh, focus on open data and AI. Let's clarify what we mean when we say open data in uh, medicine or in healthcare. Well, open data, I'm going to tell you what it's not. It's not about opening your personal data so everybody gets to become transparent. That is a wrong perception that people might have when they think about open data. Open data reflects on making public available data sets that are accessible to everyone that can be used by not only academics, not only programmers, but by everyone who has access to the internet to use these data sets to train uh, AI models. And that's what it is. It changed the, or it accelerated uh, the innovation in AI in general. So the first big open data set was ImageNet, which was in 2009, uh, 50 million images were stored in a data set that were all labeled and that accelerated development. So if people have access to really, really good quality data sets, you're going to accelerate innovation and you're going to accelerate development um, and scaling of these sets. So why I want to use open data sets um, and create open data sets is I want to accelerate AI development in healthcare, but I want to also well make it accessible to all. I want an African entrepreneur having access to these data sets so he can train his AI as much as I want a Danish or a German uh, entrepreneur or data scientist to have access to these data. When we're talking about open data, an important issue in healthcare is the lack of of interoperability and the hope is that by using open data standards we could bridge the gap in communications between different systems do you think that we can get there what actually open data is it it's kind of the honey that attracts the bees and it's creating a community and the community will then drive uh, development of standards um, if you see that on the open source software development a lot of these open source software standards have been defined by global communities that agreed of what is the standard that makes more sense to use and this is a kind of a holocratic um, a, a environment so it's self-organization by people who are in groups working together for a specific purpose if you look at the official standardization offices in each country you have an hl7 in healthcare you have fire you have an open ehr and and everybody is like putting their efforts in there but then you see like in each country a different standard developing then you have hl7 for germany and and fire for germany so these ways of setting standards are for me a very old-fashioned way to do this um, because it's not open it's based on local influence and i think opening 
of data and working around uh, creating a community that um, has a specific joint vision of what to do with the data. Uh, I think you can create way faster uh, standards that everybody agrees on as doing this in a very hierarchical, organized way with membership fees and everybody needs to pay membership and all these things to get it published and get access to uh, because that takes quite a long time. So how do you see that given what you just described, we could enable data sets that would be, you know, applicable to a larger open data research that you talked about in the beginning. It matters what kind of data you feed the system. It has to be systemized. So one dimension is data has context, and the context means in the clinical process the data was captured in. So if you store data in a system and that data is just part of a process you are going through as a physician, the data will be always context-based to that and relevant to the, the clinical process you are, perce- are proceeding. And that means that there is no standardization of clinical processes. Every doctor has his own practice, has his own methods. Some organizations standardize, but most of them don't standardize. You have guidelines, but nobody applies these guidelines in a very standardized approach. That means that Data is always context relevant. So the best data comes mostly from single organizations that have highly standardized ways of working. So that's point one. So context matters in terms of a standardization um, out of the data. The other thing is to accelerate or standardize data is, I start with, for example, imaging data. Imaging data is quite highly standardized, especially on, on CT and MRI, because the way how you take these images, it's quite standardized. In X-ray, you could have uh, different machines, different brands. The outcome could be different, so it's always hard to use data sets that have mixed vendor systems or even a mixed radiologist. is harder, but what we see is that the methods that we start applying can even overcome these differences because uh, the more data you get to train on, the more it starts even overcoming these differences. So the algorithms are getting more more smarter on even overcoming the nuances um, in the different data sets on imaging. If you talk about genomics, which is something I'm not touching at the moment because genomics and open data has a bit of an issue because genomics can't be de-anonymized because if there is a SNP that is only unique to your own DNA profile and in 10 years they're going to know this is only unique to you, then, well, you need to take away that SNP so you, that's going to be hard. But even genomics is relevant in terms of context. So if you don't standardize the way how you take a sample and how you uh, uh, proceed with your sequencing, there could be as well nuances in there. And then you have clinical data, which is documented, which is mostly in written text where you have semantics. And in semantics, there's a lot of bias. So there's a lot of challenges in which data you will use. Um, but what we see is by applying machine learning is that uh, machine learning is, is applied statistics in some sense that you can overcome this if you have larger data sets. Because in the application of your AI models, you're going to always be confronted with different physicians that use data in a different context or that uh, document data. So people think we need to standardize everything before we start applying it, and I don't think that is the case. On the one hand, in healthcare, we are constantly frustrated by the fact that different providers use different systems and data is silosed. But if you transfer that silosis to private information and medical data that we gather through gadgets and through apps and applications, doesn't that kind of protect our privacy in a sense that our data can be accumulated and analyzed because it's so silosed? One of the things with Hippo AI we have been focusing on is trying to find ways how to avoid centralization of data and and creating kind of a a monopoly on um, your uh, service that you want to apply because that's what happened with um, internet search. Google has 92% market share just because of the fact that they had they were the first to have the best search algorithm because they had the first search algorithm. Everybody started using it because everybody starts using it. They get more data because they get more data, they get better algorithms. Nobody else is using anything else because you don't find it. Apply this way of thinking to healthcare, you would think then that the first company who makes the best, best, best diagnosis, nobody else is going to go to another because it's depending on your life. So everybody's going to start using one single service. You could end up with a monopoly of medical knowledge in a privatized siloed organization, which is the fear of everyone. 
And I think there is another way to do this. There is something that is called federated learning. And it's, it's, it's similar to what we have seen in e-health, where they use federated e-health systems and e-health records, where data stays stored in, in the place where it's been documented. And then you apply um, machine learning on the local data silos that you have. And then you can centralize the learnings out of your machine learning models into um, a centralized repository without having to centralize the data it used to learn. So that means if you have thousand hospitals using a same AI model and by using that model, they train it with, with the data that they get from their patients and these AI models get more smarter, more accurate. They can centralize the learnings back into a centralized repository without having to give access to the data. This is what we call federated learning. And if you do that, that means that we can still stay to um, silo data um, in that sense and we can manage privacy uh, without having to centralize everything in a single organization. This reminds me a little bit uh, on years ago when stores started introducing fidelity cards, you know, there was already this issue, oh, but now the store knows exactly about your preferences. And I remember I had a friend, she didn't submit uh, her actual information uh, because she thought, you know, now the, the company doesn't know who I am. But in essence, that's not what the company was after anyway, because it's about accumulated data and the findings they, that they can get to get meaningful outputs. I don't think you can generalize it. It all comes, um, uh, giving data to an organization is a, is a transaction, is an interaction. If it's an intelligent machine, it's going to be called not a transaction, it's an interaction. And to make an interaction with an artificial intelligent machine, you need trust. And I think it's all about trust. And then you have to ask yourself the question, what is the purpose of the organization you're giving your data to? Um, I'm going to tell you perhaps a, a very personal experience. I'm a very early adopter of technology and I was using 23ME, which is that a consumer, a direct to consumer genomic service. Uh, or genetic service. It was 11 years ago. I was one of the first users. I paid $450 for that at the time. And uh, because I wanted to get my access to my data, nobody was offering that. And I found it really amazing. And I said, like, I'm paying $450. So I am not the product. So I thought I can trust them. But what did 23ME do a few last year? They changed their business model and they started selling the data, my data, because I gave it available for research, but they made a business model about selling my data to a commercial organization. So I made a mistake. I thought I could trust them by giving them money. And then by giving them money, I thought I'm paying for the service. But then they were doubling cashing out. So I lo they, co they lost completely my trust. And I'm uh, advising everybody in my, in my, and that's why I'm perhaps using this example. I'm advising everyone to not use their service because uh, you can't at the first say like that you ask money for a service and then you're going to double cash in on that data that you collected. So I think it's going to be all depending on which organization you're going to trust to interact and give you data with. So if you trust your retailer, your food retailer, uh, because it's want to sell you better advertisements and you don't see that he's selling your data, you can share that because you get better offerings for products that you really like. I don't think that could be an issue. You're touching upon an interesting problem that occurred now with the development of AI in the beginning, like 10 years ago, when we started to have digital services, there wasn't uh, so much maybe public knowledge or awareness where all the data gathering is going, you know. So, But now that AI is in place, some people also call data the new oil. So how do you see the problem of these um, debates that are currently happening about should we have some profit out of our data? Is this going to be something that we as consumers are going to benefit from? Yeah, I think it all started, I think, when Facebook bought WhatsApp for a company with no business model, with no income for $19 billion because they got access to data. So everybody started to understand that data became really valuable. And then suddenly it was called a new oil, some call it gold. But what are these? These are commodities. These are financial assets class that have a, have a value, a financial value. That means if uh, you look at healthcare data, um, you can ask yourself the question, should healthcare value get an asset class value at all? Because at the end, for me, healthcare is not oil. Uh, healthcare data is not oil. It's not. It's nor it, it is gold. 
It is people. How each single data set that you generate is about people. It's about their lives. It's about human life. So do we want to start capitalizing on human life? Because that's going to be the question we need to answer. Do we really want to allow people to sell their data? Uh, we don't do this with organs because we know that this is wrong. We need to ask ourselves the question, do we want this? Because if we want to start putting a dollar sign or a euro sign behind each single data set, the consequence is going to be that over time, each single molecule in your body is going to have a, a capital value. So that's, I think, for me, a very dystopian way of looking at healthcare because you're going to pay that back in terms of getting the, the general insights of the, out of the data. Uh, if you want to get it serviced uh, back to you, you're going to have to pay that tenfold back if you need a service. I think data should be free. Uh, information should be free. Knowledge should be free. It was always free. From the day Hippocrates laid the foundation. Free in what sense? Well, Hippocrates is a, is important part of medicine because he laid the foundation of modern medicine 200 years before Christ. And he said, like, when doctors took the oath, he said, you have to share your knowledge with your colleagues for free. So every physician can study medicine out of books and he can get access to knowledge. But in the future, where knowledge is going to be created by data and algorithms and it's going to be a competitive advantage for a company, they're not going to give that away for free because it's make their service better. They're not going to share this. And th this is leading then to a privatization of something that always has been a societal good, a public good, accessible to all. And if we start privatizing this, we are capitalizing on human life. And I think this is a really wrong way of looking at healthcare. But if you look at, for example, the U.S. system where you have patients with preconditions or just patients with serious conditions and a problematic health insurance, from their perspective, because they are faced with high costs, I can understand why they would be interested in selling their data to researchers if that would mean that they would share the profit of a medical research with an industry and that would help them lower their healthcare costs. I get your point, and there are a lot of blockchain marketplaces that act that way, and, and and startups that focusing on on telling that story that it's a good thing to give money to patients. I think if you're gonna financially incentivize, um, which is the same thing as putting a capital value on medical data, even if it's for a seldom disease or rare disease, as you mentioned, you are going to um, put data equal to capital. That means if you need big data sets and you always need a cohort, you don't do it with one patient that has that specific rare disease, that only those people and organization that have access to large capital will be able to do the research. So what you're going to do is you're going to accelerate monopolization and centralization to those organizations who have access to capital. It's going to only accelerate monopolization and it's not going to free knowledge. It's not going to make it more accessible. And I think it will lead to a world similar to in some areas what we see in Big Pharma, where suddenly one single company has a treatment that has an intellectual property and that's being often to the market for 2.2 million for rare childhood disease, which just happened by a Swiss. Uh, there are a few Swiss uh, big pharma companies, but the one brought a medication to the market for a rare childhood disease and the price tag of that child, the therapy is 2.2 million. Do we want it? Do we want to capitalize on each single knowledge data set that we create? And just because the patient gets a hundred euros back when he sells his data, but if a company needs to buy thousands of these data sets, then only those who have access to capital will get it. I think it's a very wrong way of looking at it. You can turn it around and say, if you make it open and free and do it with free licenses, you can really hack healthcare and make it available to all. Uh, this, what we are doing is going to just increase inequalities. What are you optimistic about when it comes to AI, data, and healthcare? I'm optimistic because 50% of the world population doesn't have access to uh, medical expertise, and AI can certainly scale medical expertise in each single corner of this planet who has access to the internet. You don't even need internet with AI on the edge. You can run AI protocols on your local phone without even have the ability to have connectivity. So it helps a lot of people to get access and it incre increases access. It also helps us to over time to uh, solve the issue of bias. Uh, bias is a huge issue in healthcare. Uh, one of the biases I always use is overconfidence. Um, so there was a, a, a paper that I always used that they asked uh, doctors, how confident are you in your diagnosis? Are, are you more or less confident? Are you confident? Are you really, really confident? And then the patients were really, really confident. They 
those who died, they did a biopsy and then they saw that 40% of these patients that the diagnosis was wrong because of the overconfidence bias. And I think these machines will be able to eliminate that bias as we, if we solve the data issue. So I'm very positive that all the issues we see on uh, medical errors, on scaling medical knowledge, on making it more accessible, that we can do that in a very good way. So inequalities in healthcare, which are very existing, if you're privately insured, you get the better physician who makes the better diagnosis. If you just have a standard insurance, you will not get the best diagnosis, that we get more equality in there. But then we need to open it up and make it free. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. Which brings us to the question of privacy, which is especially interesting when you look at Europe. Uh, on the one hand, Europe is very, very protective about data privacy in general. We've got strict laws, um, a lot of debates about um, who can access which data set. And researchers, especially those that work globally, often say that Europe is going to fall behind in development because it's so difficult to aggregate data for research. We should not sell our values, which are human rights, just because of the fact that we're going to fall behind. That's point one. Privacy has been a human right and privacy is something our grandparents have been fighting for because um, there used to be totalitarian regimes that you couldn't hide anything. And if you can't uh, hide anything, uh, you lose your privacy, you lose your advocacy. And if you lose your advocacy, you lose your freedom of speech. And then you uh, it's very difficult to counteract if you have a totalitarian regime. I think Germany learned these lessons. They had the first database that through a census where people... I had to document their religion and uh, their sexual interest. And that's was the database being used for bringing people uh, towards or getting killed in the concentration camps and not just because of the data. So I think privacy is really important. Totalitarian leaders always come and go. Uh, we see now Turkey where a lot of the people who are, have an opposite view on politicians are being jailed just because they tweeted and said their opinion it was not private. So I think protecting privacy is really something important. The other thing what we need to think of is it's going to be quite impossible to protect healthcare data because what is healthcare data? People who watch or listen to this podcast can use an algorithm and can uh, use my voice and put it through that algorithm to detect my mental state. They can see whether uh, or they can detect if I'm leading towards depression or psychosis. And there are so many algorithms being published that you can, out of voice, you can read everything about my mental health status. So my voice became, doing so, health data, but it's public. I can talk on YouTube or I can talk on a podcast and suddenly I give my health data away for free. My profile picture on Facebook can be used by a face to gene app that detects 250 specific gene genetic diseases just by analyzing your profile picture. So it's going to be really hard to say what is healthcare data, what is, what isn't healthcare data. So I think we need to start working on, do we not want to work on policies that avoid discrimination based on the data they have? So I'll give you an example. If an insurance company rejects you for not having that insurance or ask you a higher fee, I think we should perhaps look into that. Do we still want these risk models to be in place? Because if we want to have a healthcare system based on solidarity, then we should not allow these companies to create risk models. And then we should start working on policies that avoid the abuse of having access to data uh, because they already have access to so much data. And we should perhaps turn the question around. Instead of protecting privacy, why don't we start putting policies in place that protect discrimination based on the data that they have? Privacy is a complex issue, and Vince Nadai said in an episode about AI in uh, a stroke research, when we talked about ethics and AI, that basically artificial intelligence as technology is so complex that the general public generally wouldn't know the depths of it. And then the data privacy issue connected to AI is so complex that it's hard to have a public discussion on where data privacy should stand when it comes to AI. Therefore, it's really difficult to say how to develop policies and to which extent do we as individuals need to care about privacy and to which extent do we just need to trust the people that are put in the legislative positions to take care of this for us in the best possible manner. 
even before AI, I think the fact that we started using uh, WhatsApp for free, uh, people didn't care. But I think it's all a lack of education because if I, I used to, when I lecture on universities, I used to ask my students a question. Uh, it was like seven years ago. I said like, okay, if, if I would knock on your door and I said like, I'm a service for sending your letters for free to the world. But if you want to send a letter to your friend, I'm going to open your letter. I'm going to copy it and I'm going to close it again and then send it to your friend. Would you use that service? And everybody said no, because when you open a letter, it's kind of, oh, you are, this is a closed letter. This is meant for my friend. And then I asked the same students who is using WhatsApp and everybody raised their hands. Do you use WhatsApp? I use a WhatsApp for only the invitations on the groups, but for my private communication, I use Trima, which is a, a Swiss in encrypted service that you pay for. I don't believe in the uh, free uh, service model because then I'm going to be the product and people can do that. But I think there has to be a choice if people want to give away their data and they don't care, they can do this. Um, I want to take care of my privacy. And, and I think my private communication with my family, my friends and my loved ones uh, is none of the business of Zuckerberg. So how do you see that the public could be educated better and faster in this whole issue because we are overburdened with all the information and then if you look at privacy policies the first problem is are you going to read it if the only choice that you have is to agree with the privacy policy to use a service and the sec yeah and that's basically it if you can't do anything against the way things are set what can you do why would you educate yourself how can you educate yourself i recently started to educate kids from 12 to 18 on ai because i think they need to be very aware on this um, and i was amazed how well aware they are on privacy i think there was already a change I'm, i belong to a generation my parents post everything they have no clue and they're like most, the most stupidest not in set sense in terms of users uh, because they share i love my parents not that they're stupid but in the way of the act they are kind of unaware of what they do because they don't understand it in that sense and they say like I have nothing to hide and I think that I have nothing to hide sentence is really really stupid but if you look at the younger generation it's coming um, if I look at politicians uh, we saw the hearings of uh, the European Commission and the senators in Zuckerberg who were doing the hearings and it was it was a disgrace how uninformed they were on uh, the questions that they asked uh, and I said like okay these are our political leaders and I think we need to really start acting on who who we choose to be our, and become our political leader. And we need to start being more selective on uh, who do we want us to lead in this very fast changing environment. And the current political discussions, if you see this, there is um, a problem that the organizations, the political parties are very old and hierarchical. So that means that hierarchy is based on age. That means the power in these political parties is mostly surrounded by people above 40, 45, and these are the ones becoming a prime minister. Seldom, it's, you seldom see the cases like in Austria, but you see the cases where they, uh, they don't understand it. And then you have politicians that don't even know what to tweet and they think that tweeting in politics is not part of a culture you should do. And it's like, hey, this is what everybody else does. This is the world. This is like writing a letter and they don't understand this. So I don't trust these people to take the right decisions. Yeah, and I think we need to educate more and we need to work on education. This is why I started training AI classes for 12 to 18 year old kids. Technology always brings unintended consequences and oftentimes we don't really act the way we know we should. I'm referring to climate change here. We have all the data, we know what the consequences are going to be, and there's just too much ignorance about that. So for, for that perspective, I'm wondering to which extent can we expect a utopian or dystopian future when it comes to potentials and the dangers of AI? It's funny because you're now repeating the question that you asked at the very beginning. Uh, are you looking uh, in AI as a danger to society? Um, and I said yes. So uh, I think yes, there is a danger because we have um, a lack of, of, of digital skills and education. That is one point. Um, the other thing I was thinking of, you talked about utopia and, and, and dystopia. And I think this is a very passive way of looking at the future. You can only predict the future if you try to change the future yourself. And I talk about my dootopia, doing stuff. Um, and only when you do stuff, you will create your own utopia in that sense. And so it could be my topia or our topia, but it's about doing. 
And I think people are looking too much about technology being something that has an ability to do something, but technology doesn't want to do anything. It doesn't want to do good stuff. It doesn't want to do bad stuff. It is just a tool. And it's the people behind technology that give technology a purpose. And we in Europe have been a bit lacking behind in um, um, being a fast mover in applying technology and, and putting our own values in there. Um, we have a culture that is really reluctant on being a fast adopter compared to others. Like uh, we are laughing with Chinese that using facial recognition for payments. Uh, we are always skeptical, but then over time we, we then use these kind of services ourselves and we then miss the opportunity to shape the future that we want. And I think we need to look into ourselves and then ask ourselves, yes, perhaps we should uh, try to shape it more uh, based on our values, based on our standards, and become more a doer than uh, somebody who talks about the dystopian futures and the, uh, the utopian futures, but uh, we start should acting more on this. And perhaps give more, maybe not power, but uh, attention and listen a little bit on how younger generations are thinking, as you just mentioned before. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And I think it's all about, about empowerment. And um, if, if you give people access to knowledge and then empower them to create their own future. I am part of a, of a think tank faculty. It's called Future IO. We talk about exponential technologies and desirable futures. And we, um, we published a book called Moonshots for Europe. Um, and in the That book we we talked about what are the European values? How can we create our moonshots that are very different than the one from Silicon Valley, that are very different than the ones from China because we have very different values, but fit to your European value system. And I think we need to start thinking bigger. We need to be more courageous and we need to start becoming more active. Uh, but you to be able to do so, you need skills uh, and you need education for that. So um, and then we come to the sector of education and then you know this is also an issue. A lot of these school classes in Germany still have a leaflet project <laughs> they, they, they don't even have a beamer and not working digital um, so uh, we need to really rapidly change our education systems and uh, make them compatible for uh, the, the 21st century You're the founder of the HIPAA Foundation. I know you are at the moment not talking much about what the foundation does, but can you share anything about what are you striving for? I think Einstein said if you want to tackle global and complex problems, you need to think 95% and act 5%. Um, so I've, I've been thinking quite a long time, how do we tackle the, the problem of healthcare monopolization when it comes to AI? Um, I think for me, a dystopian, when you talk about dystopian views, would be that we see a Google Health or Amazon Health, although they would create a great service. I don't think it's a good idea to privatize medical knowledge uh, in, a, in a commercial company that first has to serve their shareholders and then the patients. I think we should really watch out about this model because it's always going to lead to a world where if you have access exclusive access to that knowledge that you're going to monetize on that. Um, so I thought about how can you hack this? And um, I think the way how to hack this is not looking at uh, data as a, as a commodity that has a monetary value. So what is the consequence? Okay, we need to create open data sets. If you create open data sets, then you uh, allow people to develop AI models that are based on open data sets. But what we put on the open data is a license. So if you use the open data sets, The AI models that you train are also based on an open license. So you can't kind of um, uh, monetize on, on these licenses. You already create this. And then we looked at, okay, this doesn't scale because the problem is with these platform economies that if you, if you scale an AI service really fast, you get more data and you get the centralization, what we discussed before. So we looked then into, okay, how can we solve this? And then we said, okay, this is federated learning. So these are the, the pillars that we have. We say like, okay, we are using open data, we are using open licenses, and then we are using federated learning as a technology, and the foundation is investing in in, in these. Now, at the beginning, uh, we work with uh, high net worth individuals, like really rich people who want to say, okay, we need in Europe a different strategy. But over time, when we're going to get public, we will start becoming more open and we will collect uh, public funds like a humanitarian organization um, where the people pay for uh, everything what we do because everything what we do is for the people. And if AI is there to serve us as a society, it should be owned by us. And by us, I mean the people, uh, not 
a government, because in, in a government that can go also in a very wrong direction, look at China or even look at the US where senators um, decided that abortion should not be allowed in a state. Uh, so they decided over the female body uh, by law. So imagine you have an AI that, that decides over the bodies of because they have specific ideologies. That's very dangerous. So AI needs to be owned by us. It needs to be a public good. It needs to be owned. And then you need to collect money from the people. And that's how we're going to set it up. So it will then create a community, just as in open source movements, that all work for a specific purpose. And the purpose is to liberate medical knowledge in the future, making it accessible to all. You've been listening to Faces of Digital Health. Stay tuned, read more and get more info at www.facesofdigitalhealth.com.